So we're here to talk about uh, EDA, of course, or event-driven automation. Wim, uh, in the earlier session, kind of dropped some hints as to what this might be, obviously, a Kubernetes-based automation platform, focusing very much on the idea that uh, everything in the system should be event-driven. And we now have streaming telemetry and all this uh, cool capability in our devices. We now have a controller that is able to leverage it. So before we dive into that, it is worth first calling out, uh, this is a portfolio that we have for data center, right? So this kind of completes the portfolio as kind of our automation and operations toolkit. Uh, we do have our own operating system, SR Linux. Uh, kind of Mike banged the drum on that this morning. I won't do that again. Uh, and of course, we have a, a full portfolio of hardware platforms, the correct speeds and feeds you would expect to see for data center operators. So we've kind of got the full stack here including DCI, of course, we, uh, we're quite big in the WAN as well. So kind of we can cater end to end uh, for data center requirements from a networking standpoint. Speaking of data centers, so I like to do a little bit of kind of just context setting. We actually started building this platform back in 2022. So it was a couple of years ago that we started and there was a bunch of kind of catalysts for change happening at that time. The biggest one I'm gonna call out, I won't go through all the points on the slide here, is uh, AI. So AI, I think, introduces two kind of unique things for automation platforms. For one, people are deploying a lot of more on-prem fabrics. We kind of went through that whole everything moving to the cloud. I think AI is kind of pushing things back to on-prem. People like the idea of having a model that is tuned for their requirements, where all of their you know, business information isn't leaking into some public cloud. So there's a bigger build out of data centers. As an automation platform, that's a great thing for us. That's kind of our bread and butter, building out networks. But there's actually kind of a more nuanced uh, uh, something going on with AI, which is the degree, like the cohesion you need between a compute, GPU, DPU, and the network. We've gone from these being kind of silos of automation, like we've seen in the past, to there's actually tangible benefits in making these things work tighter together. You can get better performance, which results in lower power. There's real TCO reasons for wanting to automate these things together. So when we started building this platform, we didn't actually assume we'd be automating networks at all. We wanted this controller to be completely generic. It could automate a server, it could automate a DPU, it could automate a GPU at some point in the future. Very ambitious goals, I, I do get that. Obviously we're grounding this today in kind of the first use case we're tackling with this platform, which is data center networking. But you will see over time, we will kind of expand our wings a little bit and start automating things that you wouldn't typically see a data center fabric manager uh, kind of take, take heed on. Some other kind of interesting, uh, some data points that we, uh, we were discovering as we were starting to build this platform. Today, uh, two thirds of, human of outages in data centers are caused by humans. So I think it was Uptime Intelligence that came up with this statistic, which is pretty nuts, kind of drives home that point that Mike uh, made in the morning, the idea that our networks are stable when humans aren't involved. Obviously that means they stagnate. So we need to get the, the ability for them to be reliable, to change um, without uh, kind of bringing things to their knees all the time. So that's kind of a fundamental problem we wanted to try and solve here. We think of this as generically as reliability. Your interactions with your infrastructure should be reliable. The other kind of force we saw was there is actually kind of, uh, you know, if you look at new college grads coming out, they're not coming out with CCIEs. They're not very networking focused. They're more focused on the cloud. So the talent pool that's available to us as organizations, and we see this ourselves trying to hire engineers even, it's shifting. It's shifting to people wanting to be more cloud-like. So that's the skill set that we're starting to see. And so we kind of need to naturally evolve the stacks that we're using to keep pace with kind of the, the talent pools that are emerging. So that's kind of what we saw. Now for our agenda this morning. So first I want to talk about declarative abstractions. We talked a bit about them this morning. We're going to drive home that point. And obviously we'll do a demonstration as well. Um, I will spend a bit of time on slides into declarative abstractions. I'll kind of drive home some of the Kubernetes points a little bit more. But again, I re-emphasize, you do not need to be a Kubernetes expert to use this platform. In fact, if you want to ignore Kubernetes entirely, you don't want to use that as your interface, you do not have to, right? We have a UI, it's point and click, just like any other controller you will see out there. Then we'll talk a little bit about the state of the union. This is my tongue in cheek way of saying that state is often an afterthought when, uh, when we come to automation stacks. Then we'll talk a bit about operations. I think the typical uh, thing we're seeing here is automation has typically only favored deployment and provisioning, and there's been very, very little automation on the operations side. They're typically left holding the bag, actually. So we really didn't want to leave operations behind here. There's a bunch of tooling we've built to, to assist operators. Then we have units of automation. I'm not gonna spoil what that is. Uh, and then we have revision control. So this whole GitOps theme that, uh, that Wim was talking about. So to start, 
Wim mentioned that a pod is a primitive inside of Kubernetes. Now, for those that uh, don't know what Kubernetes is, you don't need to. A pod is just a, a set of containers, potentially, and some surrounding resources that they require, you know, storage, network, all that good stuff. Now, what Kubernetes did really, really well, and as we kind of wind back the clock to 2022, we're building a new automation platform. We started looking at, you know, competitively, what is out there? What are other people doing? What is succeeding? What's not succeeding? One of the things we saw was, obviously, Kubernetes had become kind of the poster child for workload automation. So. We wanted to look at, I mean, obviously that's a given now. We can assert that without anyone contesting us. But why? Why was Kubernetes successful in kind of dominating workload automation? And I mean, we're going to assert that kind of the big things are it was declarative. So we moved from this imperative model of needing to say, this resource has to come before that resource, which has to come before that resource. And if I want to undo that, I need to reverse those steps, right? I can't do them out of order. They also moved to, uh, to those abstractions. So, Comment on the slide here is a pod, is a pod, is a pod. It doesn't matter if this pod exists in Azure. It doesn't matter if it is, exists in AWS. This unit of workload and the interface to it is common no matter the underlying implementation. So is an interface really any different? An interface has an MTU, it has a speed, it has a bunch of other configurable parameters. They're all pretty common, but every vendor implements them differently. The implementation is different. What we wanted to try and do with our controller here is think of how Kubernetes had normalized the concept of a pod. We wanted to do that for all of the networking primitives. So this is kind of the crux of how we can claim this platform as being not just multi-vendor, because these abstractions are ignoring the underlying vendor, essentially, but also multi-domain. I kind of hinted at that whole AI thing and DPUs and computes. They all have interfaces too, right? They all kind of bubble up into that same abstraction. But we're not the first ones to think that declarative abstractions are cool. Um, you know, there's other competitors out there that will claim intent-based networking. These kind of follow the same primitives. But there's a big problem. So this is kind of naturally how these platforms work. You have an abstract input, which is kind of like a, an interface, for example, a very normalized version of an interface. It goes through some machine. I'm representing that with a cog here. And some magic happens, right? There's rainbows out the other side. These are all the underlying things that that abstraction did. That's cool and all. It actually looks really, really great. But what it actually looks like is that. That gear is a black box to you. So your ability to iterate the problem with abstractions is they're opinionated, of course, right? Like I decided what an interface was going to look like, and you damn well better like it. You have no ability to change it. It's kind of typically how these platforms work. Now, as we started to engage with customers in data center, and of course, we've been present with our, our switches and our operating system for a while, one thing was very, very clear. Data centers look similar they don't look the same. There is enough nuance between customers where they have certain preferences around BGP timers, BFD timers. I want that underlay. I want that overlay. That this black box is the fundamental problem. What you really need is extensibility, right? How do we avoid that black box? This is kind of leading back to Vach's comments around IDE, right? It isn't just that this platform is an engine for you to use. It's a way that you can kind of structure your own opinions and build your own abstractions leveraging ours. So this is kind of the, the cool thing with EDA. Everything we're going to show today, as far as the automations, they're all going to be open source. So you'll be able to look exactly how we built our fabric. And you'll be able to say, I really don't like your opinions of what a fabric should do. I'm going to tweak them. Or I'm going to add support for vendor X for the fabric. So that's kind of the, the theme here is the black box is the big, big problem. We need extensibility. This kind of leads into some of that Kubernetes angles you would have uh, heard this morning from Wim. So naturally, is Kubernetes the answer? So we're building a new platform. Now, we want to be able to position this platform across a pretty wide spectrum of users. right? We didn't want to just build a platform for the enterprise, the do none yourself. I just want it to work. I want to turn it on. It automates everything, and it tells me when things are wrong. Now, big part of the market. We want to target that part of the market. And most of the demo this morning will kind of be in that theme. But obviously, there's a big chunk of the market that kind of pull from open source. They do some themselves, is my, my, my uh, acronym here. And of course, you have cloud builders, the guys that do everything themselves. Now, we're probably not going to end up selling EDA to those big guys. They all have their own automation stacks. But I didn't want to cut us off from being able to ever sell to those guys. So this platform is truly extensible. If you don't like what we've done, you can rip it all out, replace it with whatever you like. You can automate whatever you like. So we need to cover this full spectrum. And obviously, the answer here is Kubernetes has done a good job in being extensible and covering that spectrum. Right? You have kind of cloud builders using it, as well as enterprises for their on-prem clusters. So is Kubernetes the answer for a platform like this? 
Can I ask you a quick question? You may. So you, you say extensible. I think what I interpret you meaning there is it's modular mm. and replaceable. Mm. Very good. Am yes. I interpreting you correctly? You are, you are interpreting me correctly. Yes. And it has to be transparent uh -huh. for me to be able to take a module and say, I don't like this one because of Bruce's opinionated view and I'm going to exactly. put my opinionated view in. Yes, exactly. So yeah, we really wanted the control. Like You don't have to rev Kubernetes every time you onboard a new resource. We wanted that same logic here. We didn't want you to have to rev our controller every time there's a new version of an, of an operating system that gets released. In theory, those little units of automation, spoiler there, they can be revved independently of the platform. So you could you know, load our platform today, and then a new version of the Fabric comes out tomorrow that adds OSPF or something. You're like, I actually really like OSPF. So I'm going to rev the Fabric and deploy it with OSPF without touching anything else. Right? That's a fundamental design we have here. So Kubernetes. Now, Wim talked a bit this morning around it being used for a container orchestration. And obviously, uh, he told a little bit of a story of what we've started to do here. We really envisioned Kubernetes being used for more than just kind of uh, compute automation. Um, and K Kubernetes, along with the, the whole declarative and abstractions, it has some other really, really cool functionality around extensibility. So you don't have to understand the slide. It's a little busy. But I'll just call out some of the things here. Like the Kubernetes API fundamentally can be extended through something called a custom resource, the thing you see over on the right here. And you can actually write your own controller. And you say, I want my resource exposed in your API. But whenever that gets hit, pass it to me. And I'm the one who's going to do the work. So Kubernetes is natively built this way. You can extend it. So we wanted to bring this into the controller, obviously. But as Wim was uh, hinting at, that whole eventual consistency model, that reconciliation problem, the idea that I can have you know, the, the, the pod supporting the back end come before the pod supporting the front end, and it doesn't matter the ordering here, you get eventual consistency, right? But we were just making a big hoo-ha around reliability. Eventual consistency is like the antithesis of reliability. For an undetermined amount of time, my infrastructure is in some unknown state trying to get to the state I want it to get to. Right? That is the reconciliation model, the eventual consistency model, which I think for infrastructure, it would be foolish to apply these concepts blindly. You would get into states where you have no idea what state your infrastructure is in. Really, you want to be able to step it forward as a kind of discrete set. And if that doesn't work, you want to step it back. Right? We call this network-wide transactions, or you know, there's other names for it. But Kubernetes is kind of it's like oil and water to them. They do not mix. And it's kind of illustrated here. So you have you know, an OSS BSS system coming in. It's piling stuff into Kubernetes. You have users doing the same. They're just piling stuff. So you kind of get a desired view in Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is doing its best with its controllers to reconcile stuff down into reality. So this is what is really running in my infrastructure. And everything's all good until you get a failure. And then you have the real state down the bottom, which might even be hidden from you. You have no idea what state that's really in. But you're looking at this kind of desired reality. So you have no idea what state your infrastructure is in without a lot of debugging. Now, you can imagine this change was a routing policy change. So I, ended up, I tried to deploy it to all of my border routers, and it only went to half of them because there was some resource constraint somewhere, and it failed. A partially deployed routing policy is potentially uh, I mean, a death sentence for a network. Right? It could drain all traffic. So when it comes to infrastructure, applying Kubernetes kind of primitives blindly, terrible idea. But there's a ton of good stuff here as well, like all the stuff we talked about, those declarative abstractions, the extensibility. These are good things. We want to bring these forward. We don't want this, though. Infrastructure should always be atomic when it's starting to, to, to change. I'm not going to try to say that at atomicity. Actually, that sounded good, I think. <laughs> so when we think about EDA and how we leverage Kubernetes, it's kind of in three ways. So we are building a controller starting in 2022. Of course, it's built on top of Kubernetes, right? You can run this controller absolutely everywhere. I'm going to run a demonstration later today where we're going to run it entirely on a desktop that's sitting upstairs somewhere. So you can run this literally on your Mac if you want. We have guides to run this on your Mac. So if you can run Kubernetes, you can run this con controller. We also bring some of the best parts of Kubernetes forward to infrastructure automation. So all of the intent base, the declarative, the idea that everything is event driven. Event-driven is actually one of those really, really crazy things that lets us scale to ridiculous amounts, right? You can imagine a typical controller, and I mean, this is why it's our namesake, actually. It has to go and pull your infrastructure every 15 minutes or so. And you might get traps for things like you know, a link flapped. But fundamentally, you're probably doing polling. And what that means is your controller 
has to do a ton of work every 15 minutes, even if there's nothing to do, right? Nothing may have changed in the last 15 minutes, but you're going to poll, you're going to do a bunch of work. Now you can imagine what that means if, if I scale up the number of nodes, the, number of, the amount of work I'm doing is just going to like literally increase to infinity, right? We wanted to only do work when there's work to be done. And thankfully, we've kind of gone through this transition in networking over the last few years, or the last decade or so actually, to model-driven management and streaming telemetry. So we really, really focused on streaming telemetry in SR Linux. It was kind of our big, big focus, in fact. You can stream absolutely everything in the system on change, right? So you're getting immediate notifications as things change. You don't need to come in and check anymore. So that means our controller is only churning when there's churn. We aren't doing it unnecessarily. That lets us hit some really high scale numbers. We also, of course, are leveraging the Kubernetes resource model. So you will see some of our resources today in the demo. They look like Kubernetes resources. They're written in YAML. Again, you don't have to look at that if you don't want. There's a UI there, we'll, and we'll use the UI for the most part. But we kind of follow their resource model, the idea of having spec, which is like, this is what I want to have in my network, and then status, which we actually bubble up what the real status of those objects are. So we kind of leverage that as well. Now, Scott, you pointed out that we wanted to kind of discreetly upgrade things. Now, we recognize that that actually is a bunch of complexity for users, right? The idea that I'm now going to have a bunch of apps running on my controller, and each one of these apps is independently lifecyclable. So we want to try and solve that problem, too. So we built our own app store, kind of the automation app store for EDA. So you'll see this actually in the controller. We're going to show this later today. The idea here is that, obviously, Nokia are the main writers of these apps to start with. But these are the things that are open source, right? So the actual work getting done, what is a fabric? What is an interface? What is a virtual network? They're all defined in these little applications. And an application is obviously the, the intent side, the whole, here's my abstract resource, and here's some logic to convert that abstract resource into the different vendors that I support. So you know, you'll see here that we have supported OSs for these various apps. They get to define what operating systems they support. They also do the state side, so they can tap into all that streaming telemetry infrastructure we have and bubble that up into their abstractions. So this is kind of a big difference I see between this platform and maybe some competing platforms is we actually bubble state up into those abstractions. So your operations guy isn't immediately having to deal with device primitives again. We wanted to really make his life uh, a lot easier. And of course, each one of these is iteratable independently of everything else. They may have dependencies, of course, just so you can imagine there's like a little package manager in there. So our virtual network app might depend on a version of interfaces, or at least some version of interfaces. So we handle all of that for you as well. And these are the things that uh, customers can add. These are the opinions, right? These are the things that you might want to change. You might not like our abstraction. You might want to add features because you're a big Arista shop and they do something that we would never build an abstraction for because it's specific to Arista. So this is kind of fundamentally how you would do all of that. Can I clarify one, one yes. term you're using there? Event-driven automation. I'm used to hearing the term closed loop automation. Or mm -hmm. Is that synonymous or are we talking about something different? They're very, very similar. Okay. Yeah, so I, I would put closed loop automation more on kind of the intent side, the idea that you're going to have an abstraction come in, convert it into a bunch of config for all the nodes, set that config, and then subscribe to that config, closing the loop. So now if anyone comes in and changes anything, you kind of get an immediate notification up that says, your intent's no longer being met. It's been deviated. What do you want to do? I kind of consider that more the closed loop aspect of it. The event driven is more around being able to handle things like state as well. Like if you think of an event, an event is a human coming in and creating something. It's a machine coming in and creating something, right? These are both events. But a telemetry update, that's also an event. So we wanted to give you kind of programmable logic for both the config path and the state path. You can imagine you've got access to every single field in your network. You can query them at will. But what do you want to do when you, do, when you get different values back? Yeah. Right? So, so I, I think event-driven covers both those sides, whereas I think intent is really only the config down yeah, side. Yeah, this goes deeper. Exactly. Yep. 